All right, uh, so we continue with our session, and our next paper is Federico Dalbo, presenting uh, from the Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. And the title of his paper is The Sacrifice of Isaac as God's Self-Testing in the 13th Century Spanish Kabbalah. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you to the organizers, to Nicola and Katia, for inviting me here. Um, I will read the paper that I hope is not too long, but since we have half an hour to talk, I will try to keep in time. Um, we will move to a quite different perspective uh, now in uh, Jewish thought. And uh, I will start with a nice uh, a proverb and then read, which is sounds in Hebrew, En Chacham, Kebala so there is no wise as someone who has uh, possesses experience, but actually you might also translate who has been tested. And we will see how this expression extremely pertinent to the case of, uh, of Abraham. In the end house, you have uh, eight texts. I'm sorry, I've made a mistake, so I couldn't provide you the, the text in Aramaic, but uh, the math translation is fairly good. So if, I will make some comments on my own, but we can rely on it. It's quite very good. Um, so, the sacrifice of Isaac as God self-testing in the 13th century Spanish Kabbalah. One of the most tenable pages from scripture undoubtedly is a biblical episode when God has just elected Abraham as his champion uh, on earth and yet asks him to do the imaginable for his own sake sacrificing his own son Isaac on the altar of fire. Countless Jewish commentaries on scripture have tried to tame this awfully dramatic page and to downplay its abysmal paradoxical nature. A monotheistic God that asks for what only a monstrous pagan deity would do. The exegetical battle between these those who might mock the Jewish faith in a self-contradicting God was fought with a rich arsenal um, that included a variety of moral, hermeneutical, and textual tools, but that mostly culminated in the assumption that it had been much ado about nothing, nobody had been out in the end, and everybody has gotten away with a blessing. Prosperity and wellness. So not, in not in incidentally, would rather rabbinic literature also refer to the, this biblical episode, not as a sacrifice of Isaac, but as a binding of Isaac, the Akedat Yitzchak. The small semantic difference so between the binding and the sacrifice carried a substantial implication. Scripture narrated here a sort of human physical uh, comedy that both God and Abraham played roughly. As linguistic analysis will clearly show, both God and Abraham mimicked uh, the language and rites of human sacrifices I mean, mainly human sacrifices in the Near uh, Orient, but eventually substituted Isaac with an animal, as if nothing different had been implied from the very beginning. Countless commentaries from rabbinic literature um, elaborated on the tiniest detail of this biblical episode, either emphasizing Abraham's devout attitude or Isaac's indulgent sense of self-sacrifice often inserting the supernatural intervention of the devil in the already sinister narrative. And yet most of these commentaries tended to refrain from asking a more radical question, whether this biblical episode had a true terrible meaning, if, uh, um, if they feel the answer, as if they feel the answer. The admission that this narrative did actually have a theological meaning would probably have been difficult to bear and would have made impossible an effort of framing this biblical episode with classic theodicy. Conversely, the ability of asking the terrible question whether the binding of Isaac had any theological meaning at all were required to give up the classical comforting assumption of classical theodicy. Only then could one ask the question on the theological nature of the binding of Isaac. So I will start with the first paragraph is the the Book of Zohar, a mystical commentary on scripture. A radical interrogation on the binding of Isaac 
would come from the master space of Jewish mysticism, the Book of Zohar. This monumental work, a collection of several texts, ascribed to the third century scholar Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, but written by a group of Spanish mystics under the guidance of Moshe de Leon, presents itself mostly as a running commentary on scripture, I mean the core, at least, of the text. The literal frame is very elaborated. Historical rabbis from the Talmudic times, gathered in a imaginary, imaginary land of Israel, discuss in Aramaic on every relevant detail of scripture, imitating the language of classical rabbinic and Talmudic literature, but actually directing mystical exegesis towards a radical interpretation. Differently from classical rabbinic commentaries, which are mostly interested in preventing legal or moral teachings, so I'm speaking here of Drashe Alacham and Drashe Agadan, so the legal and narrative Midrashim, the Book of Zohar moves from the mystical assumption that scripture is no ordinary text but the very place where God receives proper representation in word and speech. It is the Zohar that emphatically claims that scripture is the book of God, in the double sense of the expression, a book about God and a book where God manifests himself, uh, his own place. God has his own place in scripture whose letter and language are the archetypes of creation. Jewish mysticism relies here on the implicit philosophy and language and claims for a radical form of textualism. In other words, Scripture is a place, again, Makom, uh, probably elaborated on Kayum, uh, uh, Arabic. Um, as it indeed individuates in language and letters some aspects of God's existence, but God's existence cannot rely, really be assimilated to the purest uh, text of, of Scripture. This discrepancy between language and existence is particularly apparent in a classical assumption of early Jewish mysticism. The distinction between the sphira, so the, 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 the structure of, uh, of emanation, the distinction between the sphira crown and the infinite, uh, infinite or and so forth. Early Jewish mysticism often negotiates between the need for observing every aspect of the divinity, describing every aspect of divinity, and the monotheistic requirements not to assimilate God's existence to any being in the earthly or supernal world. Um, therefore, it is frequently claimed that the highest post point of emanation meets a further dimension, the infinite or and so and that fundamentally escapes any form of individuation. And yet the complex distinction between language and existence can be appreciated more subtly in the exegetical economy that the Book of Zohar imposes to the readers. Although it presents itself as a comprehensive commentary on scripture, the Book of Zohar is neither comprehensive nor complete. Mystical hermeneutics addresses only specific portions uh, from Scripture, but this selection is not a mere matter of interpretation, but rather an implicit sign for a complex philosophy of history. As far as Scripture is the place where God's existence can partially be individuated in language and letters, only specific verses and portions are actually commented on by by the imaginary court of mystical rabbis. The articulated narrative described the beginning of Isaac is commented on only partially in few sparse pages. Differently from rabbinic literature that addresses this narrative as a whole and expounds it in every, de in every detail, mystical exegesis selects portions from the text exactly due to an implicit assumption. Everything is meaningful in scripture, but specific portions are actually more significant. Yet selecting relevant passages from scripture is not a matter of secular exegesis, but rather an answer to the true philosophical claim. Scripture is a place that provides a true individuation of God in language or letters, but this ontological determination also reflects a general arrangement of the system of emanation, famously articulated in intensive spirit ordered in a hierarchical or descending order, so from Keta to Shekhinah. Scripture truly is God's place of existence, but selecting specific portions for mystical interpretation implies a specific important correction. Not every historical event narrated in Scripture is truly historically relevant in, to understand God's ways. In other words, 
While selecting script run material to be commented on, the Book of Zohar implicitly relies on a distinction between historiographical history, or histoire, and truly historical uh, history, in German Geschichte. The distinction between these two di uh, historical dimensions is fundamental for understanding the deepest message that the Book of Zohar intended to deliver to the 13th century Spanish rabbinic elite. On the other hand, an accurate but fundamentally superficial reading of the beginning of Isaac will project this famous episode uh, on the background of classical theodicy, where even the most terrible of tests eventually results into a positive and reassuring happy end. The letter of scripture actually pays Abraham's traumatic experience by blessing him and his progeny in front of all the nations that could not participate in the beginning of Isaac and had to say at the bottom of the mountain, just as Abraham's two servants had symbolically, symbolically done. On the other hand, a mystical reading of the beginning of Isaac would manifest the true and real nature of this test and its metaphysical consequences, both on the secular and supernal worlds. Only a mystical reading would manifest truly historical, so geschichtlich, meaning of this biblical passage. A cause of selecting only the relevant verses for mystical exegesis and commenting on them according to a very specific order. So, how is the Zohar comments on the, the sacrifice of Isaac? The Zohar addresses the binding of Isaac at first in an almost unnoticed way. According to the canonical chronological arrangement of scripture, it is exactly the claim to be a mystical commentary on scripture that encourages us to address cautiously, covertly specific portions of the Holy Writ especially those that would pose an authentic hermeneutical challenge to any ordinary interpreter. Besides, the pseudopigraphical attribution of the Zohar to a prominent figure of um, Jewish cultural past, the famous Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, cannot prevent from acknowledging the risky business of delivering a mystical commentary on one of the most controversial pages from scripture. On the contrary, the authoritative aura of a prominent figure from the Jewish past actually emphasizes the danger of delivering a commentary that can really endanger the perimeter of Jewish faith. If the biblical episode has arose multiple readings from several religious perspectives, it is an actual matter of political theology to decide whether this should be called the binning of Isaac rather than the sacrifice of Isaac. Whoever would assume that Isaac had actually been sacrificed and possibly brought back to life from a host of angelic forces uh, just as a medieval midrash maintained, should keep this biblical episode within Jewish mandarins and preserve it from being assimilated by Christian culture as a typological anticipation of what would eventually happen with the most perfect sacrifice of God's only son. And yet, a two-mile reception of this biblical episode would arise the suspect that it had actually been only comedy and that no divine theodicy had ever been necessary. The theological costs for each of these two naive interpretations would be intolerable. The one interpretation would erode Jewish faith from the outside by typologically projecting it onto Christianity. The other one would erode it from the inside by removing its actual traumatic nature. Caught in the middle of this alternative, the Zohar encapsulates a magnificent theological message. Both God and Abraham were equally involved in test in the beginning of Isaac. Within a circle of biblical verses that start and end with the same eloquent, terrible assumption that, I quote, God tested Abraham. At first, the Zohar begins uh, commenting on the, on the beginning of Isaac in an almost conventional way, uh, with a short preamble that exalts Jacob as he de is destined to climb up to the structure of emanation, from its very bottom to its apex, from Shechina to Keta. It passes on commanding the famous opening from uh, Genesis 20, uh, 22 1 and delivers a few unimpressive remarks on the allusive phonetics of the word by Yehi, uh, a literary and it was, that sounds like a lament and then anticipates suffering. At this point of the commentary, nothing particularly innovative has been introduced yet. It is only this short and yet poignant interpretation of the Hebrew word Tvarim, literally things or words that the Zohar opens up to a genuine innovative interpretation of the text. 
with a commentary which is the first one you have in the handout. The commentary is extremely short. Um, it comes to pass after the lowest and upper rungs. Why that? Dvarim, as I said. I am not the man of Dvarim and I am not the man of words. Who came after this rung? Elohim tested Abraham. For the evil impulse, uh, here is of course Yitzhara, uh, came to accuse in the presence of the blessed Holy One. Uh, Likatrega um, means to accuse in front of, of uh, a court. And normally is attributed to Satan, but here is a little ambiguous. So it could also be a part of Abraham himself. We're not a part of, as also God has a soul, the bad side of God's soul. So it's a little ambiguous, the text. The Zohar forcibly connects the common Hebrew term Dvarim to the word of mysterious Tansvirot, the inner structure of the divine emanation, and especially to the lowest one, the presence of God, the Shekhinah. This association is not really justified by the Zohar, that simply just opposes ordinary language, in the one we have in Bible, to extraordinary metaphysical realities. This exactly requires a new hermeneutical parameter for interpreting scripture while commenting on it verse by verse. The former is traditional, but the content is innovative. The Zohar imitates here the form of Rashi's local commentary on scripture and Talmud, but projects it these discrete elements out of metaphysical and, yet, and cosmological reality. What is linguistically ordinary, so just the common word dvarim, is indeed metaphysically extraordinary. Accordingly, each local detail in scripture hints at a metaphysical secret that describes the inner part of the divine system of emanation. And I come to the second longer test, text. It is particularly evident when the Zohar comments on the following verse, 22.2, and addresses the call to, of the theological disputation, called the choice of testing Abraham. Um, here we will contemplate. Elohim tested Abraham. The verse should read, test Yitzchak. Since Yitzchak uh, was already 37 years old, and his father was no longer responsible for him. If Isaac had said, I refuse, his father would not have been punished. So why is this written Elohim tested Abraham and not Elohim tested Isaac? Come in here, come and see the mystery of the word. Although we had that Abraham is written, not Isaac, Isaac is encompassed by the verse through the mysterious wording Elohim tested at Abraham. It is written tested Lebra it is not written tested Abraham, the, the Abraham, but rather tested at Abraham at precisely. This is Isaac for the time he dwelt in a low power. Well, low power in Aramaic is a, a gura, so it has also to do with some virility. Anyhow, it's a power that has to do with uh, maleness somehow. While uh, well, sorry, this is German because. Um, um, Shrina is a, the only feminine, feminine uh, element in the in the system of emanation. So it's been feminized. It's been a little become a little queer, so to say. Um, at first, Zohar seems to about to object against the assumption that Abraham Abraham had been tested, when actually his son's life, Isaac, has been put at risk. So Zohar seems to evoke all traditional Jewish ob objections but actually drawn the attention to another tiny detail, the emphasis on Abraham as direct object of, of God testing. The Hebrew text emphatically designates Abraham as direct object by introducing him with the particle et, a particle that is semantically void of meaning, uh, but that has a deictic function of designating someone, something, someone or something out of the ordinary. So that very person, so really Abraham. Again, the Zohar associated the Hebrew particle to the realm of Sfirot, and in continuity with these previous remarks, it assumes that scripture is alluding again to the presence of God, the Shekhinah, the weakest of all ten, ten uh, divine emanation. The Zohar argues here that Abraham had been tested and therefore put into a specific weak position through Isaac, assimilable to the one of Shekhinah with respect to the rest of Sfirot, a, femi a feminine condition with a fully male world, uh, implying, of course, that also God is male, in the sense, in the strong sense of the expression. 
The metaphysical localization of this text within the divine, divine realm of emanation is far more important than the rest of Zohar's commentary on the local verse of Genesis 22. Two. When it elaborates on the metaphorical sense of taking a son uh, to the Mount Moria, expectedly identified with the Temple Mount. So I skip this. The Zohar pays an uh, attention, no, pay, sorry, the Zohar pays no attention to Abraham's arrangement for the journey, and that comments on the uh, following words, verse, when Abraham sees the place from afar. The Zohar manifests a specific interest in the biblical expression place that he forcibly identified with Jacob. Um, and it also happens immediately after when examining, commenting on Abraham, building an altar on the very place, Genesis 22, 9. So skipping from 3 to 4 and then to, to 9. In examining together two fairly distant verses, Genesis 24, 4 and Genesis 22, sorry, Genesis 22, 4 and 22, 9, the Zohar manifests the need for interpreting the empirical vision of a place to harbor some prophetic vision of his descendant, Jacob, whose name is already mentioned in the preamble. Jacob is indeed the most prominent of the Jewish patriarchs, as he occupies the middle line within the system of emanation, so Abraham, Jacob, uh, Abraham Yitzchak, and Jacob in the middle and therefore is able to move from the lowest to the highest dimension of Spirot. With respect of the other uh, two patriarchs, Abraham and Yitzhak, who fluctuate between the right and the left side of the system of emanation, Jacob appears to be fairly stable, as he occupies a rising and interrupted median line from Shechina to Tiferet and to Keter, so he goes up as a pillar. The integration of the beginning of Isaac within this cosmological frame is extremely important, as it manifests the metaphysical dimension of this commentary on scripture, the local literal sense of scripture actually reflects the proportion of the divine event, the assessment of the metaphysical balance between three main sections of divine edifice, the right side, the left side, and the central pillar. Accordingly, the biblical episode of the beginning of Isaac actually a description of serious metaphysical events due to the connection between microcosm and microcosm, microcosm and microcosm, man's and God's world. It is only at this point that the Zohar addresses the ethical question raised by Isaac, when cautiously asking his father where the animal to be sacrificed actually is. Uh, Genesis 22, 8, 9. The answer that the Zohar offers shows quite well how the metaphysical dimension of God is inextricably connected to the human dimension of Abraham. This is a passage in Zohar's commentary on the biblical episode, and I'm reading uh, text number three. What is written above? So we have been commenting on this. What have we said before? Above. Isaac said to Abraham, his father, my father. They had already established this, but they didn't, uh, but didn't he answer him at all? So uh, Abraham didn't actually answer. He said, here I am, here I am. So because he had withdrawn from his father's compassion, for his own, so it is written, Here I am, my son, here I am. Compassion has vanished, transformed into judgment. Abraham said, It is not written, his father said. Uh, for he did not appear a father, but rather as an, his adversary. The Zohar addresses here the human dimension of being of Isaac that could not be examined earlier. The impossibility of addressing earlier these verses was metaphysically rather than ethical. As far as Isaac is raised and placing moral question on the opportunity of delivering a human sacrifice, the Zohar interprets his fear and his father's lack of indulgence as a sort of a metaphysical virtue, a set of human sentiments that reflect, correspond and reproduce a number of metaphysical events. The Zohar's mention of, of Abraham as his son's truest adversary in Hebrew is Ba'ala Machloket, so it's not Satan, is particularly evocative as it intersects human moral qualities with the topological arrangement of Svirot in a metaphysical proportions. It is indeed true that Abraham has answered cruelly to his son, as he has sadly as he was headly asking for comfort and assurance. Yet the designation of Abraham as an adversary, this is Max's translation, 
cannot help to project the cannot help to project the animosity rising between father and son in metaphysical proportions, even without suggesting that Abraham is assuming the role of the truest adversary, the Satan. The Zohar anyhow describes this animosity in evocative terms, as if Abraham has almost assumed a demonic face in passing from one to another side of the system of emanation. God's testing does not only complete Abraham from a human emotional perspective. God's testing does not, uh, sorry, the, but it uh, does also something more. The subtle connection between microcosm and microcosm also suggests that the events occurring to Abraham also synchronously occur to God himself, synchronously, so at the same time. He is in integrating the system of emanation as eloquently maintained. The experience of testing in being tested is then recursive. God tests Abraham exactly as much as Abraham being tested is reflected upon the structure of the divine edifice. A short digression of Rabbi Shimon on the angels of peace introduces a notion of completeness and com completeness and incompletenessness that had already been mentioned from the early beginning, and that is the text number four. Uh, an angel of the night uh, called Abraham, Abraham separated by punctuation marks. For the latter, Abraham was unlike the former. The latter complete, the former incomplete. Abraham, Abraham, Rabbi Chia said, to arose him with another spirit, another act, another heart. Uh, well, in Aramaic, always uh, Akra, so it's a sinister connotation. It's always moving to another side. Well, it could be sinister. Yeah, okay. The Zohar here reaches the peak of its theological sophistication. A small detail in biblical orthography, a small bar separating the double called Abraham and Abraham, projects the dimension of testing into an exper experiential and metaphysical dimension. Abraham has completed himself by experiencing the terrible fate of being tested, but his change of heart has also a substantial impact on the life of God himself. The Zohar's conclusive comment on the beginning of Isaac clearly show that the human and divine dimension are connected in an inextricable way. Um, they are two manifestations of the same reality. Abraham's microcosm life, microcosmic life is reflected in God's microcos macrocosmic life. This connection is explicitly manifest in a subtle elaboration of the phonetics of the negative uh, particle law, literally not. That he forcibly assimilated to the almost homophonic personal pronoun law to him, with a clear metaphysical consequence. What pertains to Abraham also pertains to God himself. This is particularly evident in one conclusive passage, which is for us the number five. He opened saying, All in all their affliction, Lotzar, uh, he did not suffer. He did not afflict. The angel of his presence never uh, save, uh, saved them. Come and see, in all of his affliction, when trouble befalls them, law, with Aleph, written with an Aleph, uh, but read with a Vav, for the blessed his Holy One shares in their affliction. Uh, Abraham's fundamentally weak position was spelt in feminine terms as already mentioned, and reflected also God's sympathy for Israel's sufferings. In so interpreting Abraham's primordial condition, the Zohar circles back to the first verses of the beginning of Isaac, going back to the very starting point. In so doing, the Zohar fundamental, fundamental theological message, God and man are synchronically connected, is encapsulated within a recursive structure of biblical verses. This careful arrangement of biblical verses a specific costs, the Zohar subtle architecture of salvation requires to neglect specific verses from the beginning of Isaac. A number of important issues, Abraham's arrangements for the journey, Abraham's injunction to uh, his two servants, Abraham's ritual arrangement for the sacrifice, the second angelic call, the sacrifice of, of the ram, and the final blessing and the mute journey home, all these aspects are barely commented on as they far beyond the perimeter of salvation made of the metaphysical connection between God and Abraham. So now I come to a critic 
predict to this aspect. Okay, then. Yes. So I'm mobilize some deconstruct with notions like the supplement from origin from the Reda and ask how we can negotiate with this circular structure that bends recursively the first and the, the first verses back and forth and closes this message in with an idea that everything is fine but both Abraham and, and Isaac suffered from femininity or they were weak. So encapsulating a theological proportion uh, within a circular structure of biblical verses implies to conform to a specific economy of meaning, regardless of hermeneutical tools and the theological content, an interpreter cannot depart from the perimeter of scripture. This, is still, this still provides the outer boundaries of meaning, and proper hermeneutics shall fall within, within it. Accordingly, specifically exegetical idiosyncrasies, such as using mystical exegetical tools and forcing a local verse-by-verse -verse commentary to address metaphysical realities, are still proper ways of addressing scripture, as long as they do not formally transgress the biblical horizon of sense. The Zohar's claims to be plain commentary, a plain commentary on scripture exactly serves the implicit political theology assumption that mystical Jewish mysticism shall always be biblical in essence. And yet, this implicit statement does not prevent mystical exegesis from carefully selecting the relevant biblical material to comment on. The Zohar's intent to establish a circular argument that proves that Abraham suffered from the same weakness that had affected God. This argument is carved out from the scriptural text, selecting those verses that may emphasize Abraham's spiritual incompleteness and therefore his structural weakness and neglecting those verses that would emphasize his eventual election and renovated blessing. The Zohar here intends to emphasize the fundamental synchronicity between God and Abraham, the tester and the tested, the strong and the weak, the divine and the human. At the development stage of the 13th century Jewish mysticism, God's weakness is still unrelated to any primordial event of contraction or self-contraction like the Tzimtzum that would anticipate creation if not make it possible at all. At this stage, God's weakness fundamentally consists in his ability of participating into Israel's suffering and therefore, by mobilizing a number of gender stereotypes, assuming a preponderant feminine nature. The Zohar assumes from the very beginning that Abraham himself had been tested and therefore forced into a feminine, feminine condition of inferiority and weakness. With respect to this, God's truest test hardly consists in morally challenging the same God who had just elected him as the first member of the chosen people, and yet ask him to mimic, if not to perform, an idolatrous human sacrifice. God's truest test consists in imposing weakness upon Abraham and asking him to overcome his structural inefficiency. Only as a complete human being could Abraham truly be enti and entirely worship God. The cause of this trial were, was literally a transgression from one side to another side, the Sitrach of the Sefirot, playing the ungrateful role of an adversary against his own son. This role was described as a specific, a special Hebrew expression, with the intention of downplaying every possible association with the prime accuser of Israel in front of God, Satan. And yet nobody could really deny that Abraham had fanatically obeyed God and that his passage from one side to another side actually had been a sort of demo had actually had a sort of demonic nuance. This complex connection between microcosm and macrocosm is at the first place harmonious. Um, the Zohar intended to encompass a powerful theological message. God's and man's world are deeply interconnected within a circle of carefully selected biblical verses in order to deliver an intimate sense of harmony and completeness. But both God and Abraham participate in the same weakness, but this metaphysical reciprocity, exemplified by the recursive structure of mystical commentary of, on scripture, is fundamentally a guarantee for ontological continuity between God and man, God's 
and man's world, microcosm and microcosm. Besides, this ontological continuity is supported also by cosmological arguments, especially by the assumption that Abraham has eventually reached the same completeness that one might have alchemy alchemically reached by combining diverse elements, such fire and water. And we have this um, quote number six. As soon as he was bound on the altar, Isaac, of course, initiated to the judgment fittingly by Abraham, he was crowned in his realm alongside Abraham, fire and water compassing one another, ascending. Then the vision became apparent, water versus fire. Who would have created a compassionate father who turned cruel? It was, the, it was only so that the vision would manifest. Water vs. fire crowned the realms, until Jacob appeared and everything harmonized. Three of patriarchs completed above and below a raid. Excuse me? If you want to leave time for questions. Yeah, I'll speed up. Okay. Well, we have about five minutes. Five minutes left. So this goes, um, well, some pages after analyzing the beginning of Isaac, according to the scriptural order, the Zohar addresses one more time the challenging verses that opens up with the calling for Abraham uh, in the precedent request of delivering his son uh, as a human sacrifice. This time the Zohar does not comment the entire text on bidding Isaac, but rather offers a complete interpretation of the notion of divine test. Differently from the running commentary, the Zohar here does not exactly um, easily dismiss here the assumption that God has tested Abraham. In the previous commentary, the Zohar simply overlooked the question, or rather asked, on the human and the physical condition of Abraham. At that point, the use of the particle et to designate a direct object would only emphasize Abraham's feminine condition of weakness. At this point, which is the text uh, uh, number seven, the Zohar indulges on the notion of test and delivers a radically different interpretation that potentially endangers the harmonious, recursive, and circular connection between God and man. And we read, however, the blessed Holy, Holy One always deals strictly with the religious in all that they do, because he knows that they will not stray right or left. He tests them, not for his own sake, since he knows the impulse and the strength of their faith, but rather for they say to elevate them, as he did with Abraham. Um, then I skip to the last text, huh? which is number eight, and explain how this altation is possible. He tests the righteous. Why? The reason is that the delight of, for the blessed Holy One focuses only on soul and not on body, for soul resembles so, uh, for soul resembles souls, while body is incapable of uniting above. Come and see, when the blessed Holy One delights in a person's soul, delivering pleasure from her, he strikes the body so the soul can dominate. As long as the soul corresponds with body, soul cannot prevail, but once the body is broken, souls becomes dominant. The impact of this passage on the previous commentary can hardly be underestimated. Whereas the previous running commentary on Genesis has provided a description of a harmonious con connection between God's and man's world, this fairly isolated analysis of the notion of test offers us a, a different insight. At, at this point of this analysis, the Zohar rather builds on a specific hierarchy between body and spirit that has to be, to be overcome and prescribes the necessity of overcoming bodily hindrance in order to achieve a superior spiritual condition. And yet this traditional exhortation to self-improvement is not communicated in moral classical philosophical terms. The Zohar exalts here mind over body, but hardly recourse to the traditional arsenal of classical philosophy. Its strategy is much more cynical and brutal. It involves the manipulation of meaning of Isaac uh, and its exemplary use of a potential annihilation of body in favor of an eventual exaltation of mind. In other terms, God's testing would have consisted in annihilating someone's body in favor of his spiritual uh, self-fulfillment, regardless of the fact 
that this test had requested to fulfill Abraham's spiritual wellness at the cost of annihilation of his son's body. The lack of adaptation for this fundamental asymmetry surely qualifies this reading as cynical and brutal, but its ultimate perturbing nature has not been revealed yet. When set in continuity with the previous running commentary on scripture, this fresh interpretation of the notion of test seemed to supplement the previous description of a harmonious connection between microcosm, microcosm and microcosm. In other terms, the second explanation on God's testing, Abraham appears at first as an essential extra to somehow that would be complete in itself. If microcosm and microcosm are harmoniously connected and synchronized, there would be no apparent need for insisting on the symmetrical dynamic between body and soul. The supplement, based on expected and expressed assumption from classical philosophy, but cynically applied to the case of the beginning of Isaac, appears to impose a specifically dynamic dynamics where God's and man's world might have appeared in connection but still somehow static, only present and interconnected. On the contrary, the second analysis uh, on a fundamental verse from the beginning of Isaac, the, the, the second one, seems to distance itself from the previous running commentary on scripture and its implication, possibly putting into question the assumption that microcosm and microcosm are connected. In light of this supplementary commentary on the beginning of Isaac, the Zohar seems to betray fundamental Latin suspicion towards an organic explanation that the interconnection between God's and man's world, wishing for a clearer, more linear, and potentially less problematic theology. Thank you.